Well, hi, everyone. I'm Margaret Tollev. I'm the Managing Editor for Politics here at Axios. And a reminder, uh, you can all follow today's discussions on Twitter with the hashtag What's Next Summit. Now, it's my pleasure to welcome to the stage Northrop Grumman's Chairman, CEO, and President, Kathy Warden. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Ah. Kathy, um, there's so much to talk about, but I think the Russian invasion of Ukraine is on everyone's mind. And maybe we can start there when we're talking about the future of uh, defense and technology and how this all comes together. Um, for sure, it's been a wake-up call for the West about many things, including cyber. And I wanted to start by asking you about cyber. Um, essentially, what threats around cyber are you most concerned about right now? And how much of this uh, is for the administration and the Congress to work on versus how much is this a private sector issue? I think it's absolutely an issue for all of us to work on together. I just spent the morning in a cyber task group with government and industry collaborating on how we share information because this is really a time unlike any other where our adversaries who seek to get information are not gonna necessarily come through channels that are obvious. We have to think about the way we're implementing technology in our companies and the vulnerabilities that that use of technology creates. And if a company isn't thinking at the same time about their technology implementation plans and their cybersecurity plans in tandem, we're already behind. So this absolutely is an issue for the private sector, but the private sector doesn't have access to information that the government does. And so that's why the information sharing between government and industry is so important. Do you see any evidence that this effort has been stepped up since the Russian invasion of Ukraine? I know a lot of investments in work in cyber are tied to, to budget cycles and defense authorization cycles. Um, how has the, the war changed this, and uh, are you convinced that the proposals in the budget package, for example, uh, are, are taking this where it needs to go, or, or are there specific areas where you think there needs to be more investment or, or more direction? I absolutely see efforts have been stepped up, as well as the funding to support them by the federal government. And the sense of urgency on the part of the private sector has certainly been elevated with just the understanding that cyber now will be a tactic used in conflict and that we all need to be prepared for it. The Shields Up initiative that this administration launched has helped to create that awareness with the private sector. At the same time, there are tools, information sharing mechanisms that enable businesses to do their part. But at the end of the day, when we're talking about cyber techniques being used in a conflict situation, the government has a really important role to play. And this administration has stepped up to that charge. I think when we talk about the future of war, like increasingly we are talking about areas like cyber and areas like 5G, um, maybe even more than we're talking about boots on the ground or the use of drones or that sort of stuff. So I also wanted to touch on 5G. Um, China is said to be far ahead of the US in terms of its build out of 5G. How concerned are you about that? And uh, can you give us a sense of what is happening on the U.S. front to try to, is that gap closable anytime in the next generation? Mm -hmm. Well, let me give you some context on why I think technologies like 5G are so important. When we think about today's environment, it's less about the traditional arms race of the past, and it's more about the technology race of today and the future. And I think that what we will see is that conflict takes on a different meaning in terms of how operators engage in cyberspace. Uh, and there are all kinds of ways that our government uses technology today to share information and enable assets to work together. We have to think about that being done securely. So it's not using commercial infrastructure directly, but it's using the technologies that exist in the commercial world, like 5G. 
So we have launched a partnership with AT&T and Northrop Grumman to come together and provide the government that same type of connectivity that we rely on in 5G to connect assets in the government. Think of it as the, uh, the internet of things that we engage with every day in our lives now with assets that are federal assets and military application. Kathy, I wanna stop you for a second because I am familiar with Northrop Grumman's work with the Department of Defense on I think it's called JADC2, and you've now mm -hmm. exhausted my knowledge <laughs> limits on 5G mm -hmm. and defense. Um, but uh, the, in, the, what you just said about a partnership with AT&T is news, is mm -hmm. it not? It is, absolutely. This partnership between Northrop Grumman and AT&T takes the, what we each bring in expertise of working with clients and working with this technology for communications and integrates it to be able to more rapidly provide the Department of Defense what they need to support their vision of joint all domain command and control. Is it happening now and how does it actually work? Because from what, what I have, from my limited knowledge base about this, this sort of involves like putting sensors on stuff and connecting stuff across branches of the military. How much of that is already uh, in place and, and to the extent that it's not in place, how does it limit the ability for the military to coordinate? It's largely not in place today. Platforms that have been built in the past were never really designed to be able to communicate with one another. Uh, it's, if you think about your own technology in your home, it's like having a refrigerator from the 1990s. It was never designed to be technology enabled. Whereas if you buy one today, you will be able to do settings and get information from your refrigerator about what is in it and what you need to restock. It's just a whole different set of capabilities enabled into the platforms. So because platforms weren't built to uh, work that way, it would be very costly to replace all those platforms. What instead we're working on is the ability to connect and interface, so build communications capabilities that allow that interconnectivity to happen without having to change out the platform And what itself. are we talking about connecting? Well, like, what are we talking mm -hmm. about connecting? Are these... Um, missile systems, mm -hmm. are they uh, aircraft, what are they? Yes, all of the above. We can communicate with just about every platform, sensor, and weapon today, but in stovepipes. This is about connecting all of those stovepipes together, so having a backbone of communication that allows these assets to share information. One may sense a threat, another may be capable of uh, destroying that threat, but they should be able to share that information to work together, even if they weren't designed to do so. How does That's, it work right now? It's like some guy in a command center, yes. like on the phone, like and it's in a slow. movie? It's and slow. It's slow. And there's sticky notes and all kinds, of, and I'm not trying to put 3M out of business, but at the end of the day, it's not a very efficient process for people to be passing information through humans uh, to get this work done in the time frame that we need it to be done. Speaking of time frames, how long does a project like this take, and how much will it cost? We expect to be prototyping technology within a year because the technology is not the hard part. We have solved the technology challenge in this area. It's the application of it to existing assets today. And that really will operate at the speed the government is ready to move along with industry in incorporating these technologies into the way they operate. Do you need uh, like a telecom partner? And I, I'm trying to understand whether the defense application is more likely to propel the consumer application or whether the consumer demand is more likely to propel the defense application? We think it's a bit of both. In areas like space where we operate commercial uh, federal government in the exploration mission with a partner of NASA and in the Department of Defense with national security applications, we find there's a lot of core technology that stretches all of those missions and we're able to apply it to different applications. I think the same is true when we partner with commercial partners who are looking at consumer applications or business applications, there's a lot of commonality in what the government needs and we can move faster together. But if a prototype is a year away, this is what, a decade long project? 
I see joint uh, all domain command and control, which is the federal government's vision and particularly the Department of Defense vision for how these assets get connected, taking, yes, a decade. But at the end of the day, the technology will be there. That will not be the limiting factor. The limiting factor will be how quickly it gets adopted and brought into their command and control structure. Um, while we're talking about the future, can we do space, a little bit of space? Sure. You're not an astronaut. I'm not. <laughs> but increasingly, a lot of Northrop Grumman's work is in space or around space or about space. Um, Northrop Grumman has worked on the Webb Telescope, mm -hmm. right? NASA's Artemis program. You are a supplier for the International Space Station. Mm -hmm. Space Force is a client. Yes. What space work are you most excited about right now? And what do you worry about the most when you think about the prospect of militarization in space? Well, it's like picking your favorite child, which I never do, to say what part of the space mission is most exciting, because frankly, they're all incredibly exciting right now. The James Webb Space Telescope, which you mentioned, is now in orbit a million miles from Earth. It will look at light from around the time of the Big Bang and help us to better understand the origins of our universe and look at exoplanets that we've never seen before. So that's pretty darn exciting. But then when you think about the fact that we've developed the first uh, satellite that will help sustain life in other satellites. So again, satellites that maybe had a 10-year life. We're going to be able to extend that life for commercial partners, for government partners, so that we can drive down the cost of operating in space significantly. That's a first step. That's pretty exciting. And then the work we're doing in national security, which I can't talk much about, test the limits of what can be done from space every day. And so it's the kind of work that our talent really wants to be involved in. It's what helps us to attract talent to the company. So that's incredibly exciting. So there's not one area that's most exciting. The one area that I worry most about is we have had freedom of operation in space for decades. And that opportunity no longer exists. Space is becoming crowded. There's a significant amount of debris in space. And other countries have the ability with anti-satellite technology to remove assets from space if they choose. So all of this means that space is becoming an environment that needs stronger governance models, relationships between nations to figure out what it means to respectfully operate in space. And this is, again, not a technology problem. Our company is a technology company. Uh, we find those challenges really exciting to work on, but oftentimes the policy challenges are the ones that delay the application of the technology that's available. Any big policies for us to be watching this year? I, it's my sense as a uh, political journalist that not a whole lot more is going to get done in Congress uh, ahead of the midterms, but what should we be watching on the space front? It, it, space policy is developing in the background. I wouldn't expect to see anything yet in the foreground. It's not one of the highest priorities right now, but it certainly is something that the U.S. and our allies know need to be worked, and norms and behaviors in space is something that this administration is taking on, have made some public statements about, but I don't expect any big news on that front. The remainder of the year. Space tourism is a thing that um, we talk and hear more about. Um, uh, I'd sign up to go if I could afford to or won the space lottery. Um, do you think you'll be traveling to space anytime soon? I don't have a ticket yet, but uh, I do believe that I wouldn't have believed this if you would have told me as a child that one day I, as just a normal person, would be able to go to space in my lifetime. I would have told you that that probably was ambitious and a little bit science fiction. Uh, today, I do believe it. I believe I would have the opportunity to do that if I chose to, and that more and more people will. And I certainly think our children are of an age where space has seen a renaissance, and children uh, today are getting the opportunity to think about could I live in space, not just travel to space in my lifetime? And that's pretty darn exciting. Um, back on Earth. Yes. <laughs> I want to go back to Ukraine for mm -hmm. a moment. You've been CEO of Northrop Grumman since 2019. You joined the company in 2008. Uh, I have read that 9-11 changed the course of your career. I'm wondering if you would share with us why and whether you think 
that there is maybe a generation of experts who might be entering the defense space for whom this invasion of Ukraine is going to be a pivotal moment in their lives? I do. I think as we have moments like 9-11, uh, which in my case, my husband was working at a government installation that was targeted and was evacuated. My mother was at the Pentagon, experienced the same thing that day. And I was running a business that had major clients in New York City. The only reason I wasn't in New York, I typically uh, was, is because I had just returned from maternity leave and having my first son. And it was a rude awakening to me as a US citizen to have an attack on US soil, something I had never thought would be possible. And it changed my life because that day was one of the hardest days I've ever experienced. And I thought to myself, if I can do anything to help my children not grow up in a world where they're afraid of this on a daily basis, I wanna do that. Unbeknownst to me, because I was working with commercial clients at the time, my company also did work with the government and the intelligence community and asked me if I'd go for a short period of time and work with the intelligence community on information sharing to help address the issues that had in part led to the events of 9-11. And I said, absolutely, I'll go do that for a short period of time. Well, here I am in the industry, uh, never looked back. And it's because I want to work on things that have mission and purpose in preserving freedoms and protecting people. And that's what our company does on a daily basis. I think we're at that moment again now that particularly citizens in Europe would have thought they would never experience what they experienced in the world wars, in particular World War II, and yet this invasion of Ukraine for many Europeans feels terribly familiar. And we are having young people, both in the US and our allies, that know if they get called upon to go engage in conflict, that they're willing to put their lives on the line. We take that incredibly seriously in our company. And it is our purpose to give them the best tools available to protect themselves while they are making this choice to go and preserve freedom at all costs. And so this is a moment in time where I think many eyes have been opened, reopened to the fact that these threats exist and we need to be prepared to deal with them. Um, we're, uh, as we bring this conversation in for a landing, it has been my observation also that, um, and maybe this is generational, uh, that uh, investors, younger generation of investors has pushed companies to move away from any involvement in cluster bombs, even if indirect. I know that's uh, uh, something that uh, your company has thought through also, that watching the Russian invasion of Ukraine, there has been um, uh, a renewed discussion about the morality of war, of the ground rules of any kind of war. And um, a lot of conversation about defensive versus offensive military capabilities. Uh, Eric Schmidt was in recently for a visit, and we talked about uh, what he said. He'd like to see more innovation around defensive systems mm -hmm. to make civil society safer from war. I'm wondering if that's something that you've been thinking about and how Northrop Grumman you know, wants to participate in that conversation. Mm -hmm. I strongly believe that deterrence of conflict is always the first objective. And so our company is leading the modernization of the US strategic deterrent, which our allies also rely on. And in many ways, it's not about building weapon systems that can overpower the, the weapons of our adversary. It is about having the defensive posture that other adversaries wouldn't want to get into a one-to-one -one conflict. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the conversation, in today's environment, that's about arms to some degree, but more and more, it's a technology race. And we can have deterrence through technology application and utilization that would deter an adversary from engaging in conflict with the US or one of our allies. And that's always the goal. Kathy Warden, uh, we are out of time. We will leave our conversation here for now. Until next time, I want to thank you so much for joining us. Thank and, you, Margaret. I uh, appreciate the conversation. Thanks. Good to be with you.